recording started. I want to welcome everybody to SALT Project Virtual Meetup. Um, we love getting together. This is our second virtual meetup that's catered to the Asia Pacific Japan time zone region, and we're really excited about it. Um, we love being able to connect with more people in the SALT community and uh, people who are interested in becoming part of the SALT community. So I am Janae Andres, the SALT community manager for SALT Project. And I'm here with Thomas Hatch, who is the creator of SALT. And he is um, absolutely fantastic. We love whenever we can get him to speak. And we actually have him speak more than probably he, he would like. <laughs> we keep him busy. And we're really glad to have him today. Um, he's going to go over some things about remote execution, which I find particularly interesting. I get to spend a lot of time with Tom when we do um, a video series called Salt Air, which is on our YouTube channel. So if you want to hear more from Tom getting really granular, if you will, on salt, um, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch some Salt Air episodes. We also have a podcast called The Hacks, which you can listen to anywhere you listen to a podcast. Um, and it is also Tom uh, with Chunga, and they have a really great podcast talking about all things tech and a whole lot of humor. So that's really fun. Um, anything you want to know about the SALT project can all be found on saltproject.io. So if anybody wants to check out more of events that we have, um, just information in general, saltproject.io is a really great place to go. And of course, I'd also like to plug our upcoming conference, SaltConf. It's our eighth annual user conference for SALT. And we're really excited to get everybody together um, discussing all things SALT. We have a lot of fun things planned. It's November 3rd and 4th. It is fully virtual. Registration is free. You can link to that um, through saltproject.io, but also you can go directly to saltconf.com. And we're really looking forward to that conference. Um, we do have a question in the chat asking if there's any link between the SALT name and most of the team being based in Salt Lake City. And there's not. And it's funny because some of our past SALT comps were actually in a place called the SALT Palace. So that was extra fun um, to be in Salt Lake City in the SALT Palace for SALT. Um, but there, there is not a connection there. And I'm sure Tom can elaborate even more on that one. But uh, yeah, go ahead, Tom, sorry. Yeah, so um, I've been asked that question a number of times if uh, the name Salt has anything to do with Salt Lake City. Back in 2011, I was on a uh, I was on a podcast, more um, um, like a vlog, and uh, halfway through, he asked me, "Hey, where are you from?" And I said, "Salt Lake City," and he said, "Oh, so that's where the name came from." And and if you were to go back and watch it, you'd see my face kind of goes blank, and I go. I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I named it Salt because I was trying to come up with something that expressed that everything it touched, it made it just a little bit better. And Salt does that. It does. Uh, excellent. And so we're really excited to dive in. Um, thank you, James, for the question about Salt. We love uh, jumping back into our origin story. All good superheroes have one. So of course, Tom's got a great origin story for Salt. Um, so we're excited to jump in and talk about remote execution. Uh, we'll try to have some time for Q&A at the end, um, but we'll go ahead and get started to maximize our time. So Tom, I'm gonna let you take it away. All right. So the last presentation I did over Zoom, uh, my my VMware credentials expired midway through the presentation, and it and it cut cut the whole thing off. So I've really got to get in the habit of downloading a PDF or something. <laughs> um, all right. Now, as we start in here, this is an introductory talk on using Salt, which is similar to what we did last time. Um, but so I'll do a quick overview of what is SALT again. So SALT is a complete systems management, uh, really a complete systems management abstraction. And so it has this management model that is based on the idea that if we can manage the state, the flow and the events of systems and devices, then we can manage every aspect of how they function. 
the state being the state that they reside, the flow being being able to reach out to those systems and make changes and query them and get live information about large data, data centers, and event being the events that are being generated on the remote systems and dealing with them as they occur. And so again, the whole idea behind SALT is that if we can put these three things together, we can abstract complete systems management. And so when it comes back to using SALT, uh, the last meetup that we have, we had, we focused on, uh, we focused very heavily on configuration management. Uh, but this time I want to talk about uh, getting started, some of the components that we have inside of SALT, how to use them, uh, and some of the things uh, that you need to be aware of to be able to use the remote execution or the flow features inside of SALT. And so the first thing that I need to say is that using SALT is extremely easy. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to get started. And there's a lot of different use cases that you can solve with SALT. And so as we get started, I want to introduce myself really quickly. My name is Tom Hatch. Janae gave me a fantastic introduction. Uh, I created SALT or was the first, yeah, I created SALT back in 2011 um, in my basement. And it's, uh, it's been quite the ride. It's been quite the, quite the 10 years <laughs> of uh, building out this, this concept and this application and seeing it uh, go around the world and be used so widely. It's been very exciting. So let's talk a little bit about the major components that we're gonna be going over with SALT today. First is the master. The SALT master is what controls all of the SALT minions. That master is an event hub and a coordinator so that it's easy to be able to send out routines to large numbers of systems in parallel through the master. Uh, but the master is also used to distribute files, gather information, and as a central event hub for everything that's happening inside of an infrastructure. And so we're going to look at how to set up and use a master uh, today. Next, there's the minion. Uh, the minion, of course, uh, is the agent. And since that agent is running on uh, the systems that we're going to be managing, uh, then we need to look at how to set up that agent and how to get it moving. The SALT CLI is used on the SALT master to communicate with the SALT master out to the agents. And so in so doing, uh, what we end up with is the ability to, again, make remote execution calls, command those systems, query those systems. And the last thing, the last major component that we're going to talk about today is targets. So when we have a large group of systems that we want to address, then we can target them in very dynamic ways. This is also something very unique to solve. The vast majority of system management uh, softwares out there utilize IP addresses and host names as the sole mechanism to target and determine groupings. And one of the things that's exciting about SALT is that there are many different ways that we can create dynamic groups of systems to execute routines on and query. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the overall architecture. The SALT master has an event-driven system, like I said, all of the events that are happening in the entire managed infrastructure are flowing up through the SALT master. And that SALT master is coordinating the remote execution and the config management. Um, it's able to manage uh, every major operating system that's out there today, and quite a few not quite as major operating systems as well. Uh, so if you're running an operating system in a production environment that isn't managed by SALT, uh, I'd like to hear about it. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so all the major Unixes, uh, Mac, Windows, uh, every major Linux distribution, um, and quite a few less than major Linux distributions as well. And then the minions typically are an agent which is connected up in a, with a persistent connection up to the master. 
but we also support agentless minions. And so the agentless minions are ones that we can connect to over SSH, which means that you don't have to deploy an agent um, and they only exist so long as you are out and connecting to them. Uh, so you run a salt SSH command, goes out, manipulates the system, and then cleans everything up. Uh, we also have proxy agents or proxy minions, and those are able to be a proxy for a system that only has API access. So if we can't put a native agent on a system, which is typically something like a, a network switch or an IoT device, uh, then we can bridge, we can cross that bridge as well. There's one other component here that is pretty new that we're excited about, and we're in the process of brushing up and making a lot more reliable. Um, it's a system that we have that's called Heist. And what Heist does is it uh, gives us an ephemeral agent. And so with an agent, you have to formally deploy and manage that agent. With agentless, it's very, very slow because we have to make new SSH connections, deploy a lot of uh, code over the wire, and only then come back and run a single command and then clean everything up. Heist creates, again, an ephemeral agent. What that means is that we're able to use SSH to reach out to a large group of systems and set up an agent that then connects back a, as a fully functional agent. But as soon as we shut down Heist, it contacts all those systems and cleans up the agents, leaving no trace, like a good Heist should, that that uh, agent was ever there. And so the end result there is that we have the maximum flexibility when it comes to managing uh, operating systems with masters and minions. So again, SALT is extremely powerful, but also very easy. It can be stood up in seconds, and we have deployments in the hundreds of thousands and have been able to test SALT to, the, to a scale of millions of managed systems, or sorry, over 1 million managed systems. Uh, we, we haven't run into a situation where we've needed to uh, even pretend to go higher than that. Um, there are a lot of concepts inside of SALT and a lot of stuff going on, um, but you only need to know a very small amount of SALT to be very effective. And with great power comes great optionality. The, the amount of flexibility that you have in SALT is massive and we're gonna be able to, we're gonna, uh, we're going to be able to tiptoe around some of that flexibility today. But don't let that throw you off, because effectively, we make really simple defaults. We make things work out of the box. We make it so that, again, it's really easy to just get things going. So like I said, with optionality, there's a lot of different ways that you can download and deploy and run SALT. So there is the single binary of SALT, which is the easiest way to get started. And the single binary approach would, works for really 90 to 95% of our users. Uh, there's a few users who need some flexibility aspects of SALT that go a little beyond um, what the single binary does. And to do that, we've got a few other ways to install. Uh, we have, uh, and then we're in the process of moving everything to default to the single binary mechanism. Uh, but we also have system packages and uh, so that you can install using um, all of the system packages for say uh, Red Hat Linux, uh, CentOS, or whatever the new variant of CentOS someone decides to be on, Ubuntu, Debian, Arch Linux, et cetera, et cetera, um, Apple, um, and Windows, of course, as well as uh, AIX and Solaris. And we also have a bootstrap script. The bootstrap script is just a shell script that'll run on any Unix system and uh, we'll download and install salt on that system. And so easy to get going. And so I'm gonna start with a demo where what we're gonna do, uh, can everybody still see my web browser? Got Firefox going here. And 
We're going to go to solveproject.io. And Firefox wants to restart. Of course it does. How rude. <laughs> I think I jinxed you a long time ago when I said my favorite presentations are the ones where something goes wrong. I think ever since I said that, something's gone a little off. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's the Mozilla team are out of control. You're driving everybody crazy right now. I was going to say, uh, I actually recently said to myself, just, just like a few days ago, hey, I'm going to try and switch back to Firefox. <laughs> um, and until this very moment, <laughs> I have uh, had absolutely no problems. <laughs> But Firefox is right. I did restart that. <laughs> or I did I did update it in the background. And so that that probably is my my fault. Um, I do want to let everyone know we do see questions um, in the chat and we'll definitely try to get to them at, at the end for sure, unless Tom wants to grab them somewhere in the middle. But um, feel free to continue to post questions in the chat. So what I think that we're going to do is I'm going to run through the next demo. And then while I get the slides back up, I will, um, I will cover those. Uh, I'll cover a couple of cover those questions. Uh, while you're doing that, Tom, if um, those on the call wouldn't mind throwing into the chat where you're joining us from, we just really like seeing what our reach ends up being. I know we have some people from India, but I'm really curious um, where everyone's hailing from. I know a lot of people from um, we had Singapore and Sydney a lot last time, and um, looks like we have Sydney again, and Delhi, and Malaysia, Beijing. Tom, whenever you're ready, feel free to continue. Okay. So, if we go to the SALT, uh, SALT project page and then click on download, it opens up the repo. As you can see, there's instructions for installing on virtually any, uh, almost every major operating system. I'm gonna to go to the single binary install and uh, just download the single binary, which again is super easy. And then I'm going to come back and share my terminal. Uh, there was a question, which is, uh, I've heard some objections where people say that salt is really hard and that Ansible is easy. Um, salt is extremely easy to use. We have a bad rap in the market primarily because Ansible users and uh, Ansible is marketed against us very aggressively, and we haven't we didn't do a good job of that, especially in the early days, claiming that we're very difficult. Uh, generally speaking, when we've had bake offs, and I shouldn't say generally speaking, almost universally, when we've had bake offs between Salt and Ansible, uh, users have come back and said that Salt is easier. The Salt is easier to stand up, and Salt is easier to use. Um, People who've come back and look at our config management language say salt is easier. Uh, people who have uh, gone through the process of learning salt say salt is easier. Where I feel like we are right now is that we have a few difficulties with getting people started with salt and that uh, it helps prolong this perception. But every time we've seen a legitimate bake off, uh, the answer is still the same that it takes people about the same amount of time to get started with Ansible and SALT. And within one to two weeks, the SALT teams have made significantly more progress. Um, I will jump in here with a plug for SALTConf, um, that user conference that we have coming up in November. We are going to have some several beginner labs. So those of you who are just more interested in getting involved in SALT, um, we are opening up several labs. Again, they're completely free. You just have to register. So um, the labs aren't open for registration yet, but if you get on the, if you register for the conference, you'll be able to get that registration link when the labs open. So it sounds like several of you would be really interested in that. 
Okay, so I downloaded the single binary of salt. And so now I've just got it sitting in my root directory and I can just run salt. And this is one of the things that's really great about, about salt and, and arguably since it came up uh, that makes salt a lot easier than Ansible is that you can run it from a single binary. You don't have to go through the Python deployment process. You don't have to have Python installed. You don't have to worry about any Python dependencies. You can grab a single binary and you can just get going. That single binary of salt can then be used to start up a salt master. And bam, we have a salt master running. If I move over to another terminal and still using the single binary, I can spin up a salt minion using the same, the same binary. Now, I skipped a step. If we take a look at the minion config, let me comment that up so it looks more brand new and raw. If we take a look at the minion config, when the minion starts, it needs to know where its master is. By default, it's going to look for a master under the DNS name of salt. Um, in this case, I've changed the config to look for a master on localhost, which makes demoing a lot easier. I, I don't have to stand up a, a big environment to be able to show people how things work. And so what we're looking at here is that uh, the minion starts up and it connects back to the salt master. And so again, now that we've got the, uh, the salt binary running, we can say salt key. And we can take a look at all of the keys that the salt master has right now. And it's being slow. Janae, you did jinx me. <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm, okay. just, I'm so powerful. <laughs> now you may have noticed my laptop's name is Fenrir. Uh, huge fan of Norse mythology. And so we've already accepted the key. If we hadn't accepted the key, then I would just be, then it would show up under unaccepted keys. And I would be able to just say salt key dash a Fenrir to accept that key. Now they're going to automatically connect. If a minion has, has a requested connection from the master, but the key hasn't been accepted yet, all you have to do is accept the key and then the minion will automatically connect within a few seconds. And so that resolution will happen automatically. So the next thing that uh, we can do now that we've got everything uh, slated and moving is that we can run a remote execution command. So the remote execution command I generally like to start with is just test.ping. Mm. And so mm. test uh, the test.ping command is only going to it's going to go out to all the connected uh, minions and ask if they're there. The other thing that I'm going to mention is that I've got salt natively installed. The salt binary is out there to make it really easy to get started with salt, um, but it takes a little longer for it to start up um, than if salt is uh, installed because salt is written in Python and making a single binary of a Python app means that every time we run it, we've got to do a little unpacking. And so you'll notice that salt itself is uh, much faster than it was appearing before. So the command that we're looking at, let me go over this, is we call salt, we give it a target, and we tell it the function to run on all of the minions that are inside of that target. Now I've only got one minion attached for simplicity's sake, but the thing that I'm excited to say is that if I had 5,000 minions attached to this master, it would still take this long to get all of those returns. To be perfectly honest, the thing that takes the most time processing the returns from thousands of minions to a single salt master 
is printing the return information on the display. All right. So I just ran this little command, test.ping. It just returns true. It just says, yep, these are the systems that are connected. But salt is internally documented. And so if I want to see every command that is available on uh, my target systems, I can just run sys.doc. And it has overflowed my buffer. And we're still in the Z's of all available commands. And so if I instead pipe this over to less, then we are going to see all of the different, all of the commands that are available to execute through salt. And so as we can see, there are a lot of functions that are available. Um, and one of the other things that's nice is that uh, we have full integration into things like Ansible. When it comes back to using salt, and especially using salt compared to other configuration management systems that are out there, um, is that salt is the only one of those systems that has remote execution built in as well. And it still has the fastest remote execution out there, despite the fact that uh, both uh, Chef and Puppet have tried very hard to build remote execution systems uh, that are as fast as SALT. And so I, I have to admit, I find it quite ironic that SALT is open source. And the way that we do it is clearly available and uh, I haven't been able to replicate it. Makes me feel good. <laughs> okay. But one of the very common use cases for salt is uh, also to be able to do things like take an environment that's using Ansible and speed it up. Ansible is very, very, very slow and salt is very fast. So there's a lot of reasons for this. First off, from a remote execution and a fan out perspective, Ansible doesn't have a single command system. It's only configuration management. Next, Ansible creates new SSH connections for every command that is sent out. This is very slow and very taxing. And so when it comes back to salt, we have active connections. And those active connections are over an extremely efficient, optimized bus that uh, has been very specifically created to be able to manage large numbers of parallel systems. It is a purpose-built communication bus. Um, what, what I did in making it is that I went back to some of my experience with the US intelligence community, as well as some of my experience in uh, high-performance trading and took a lot of concepts about asynchronous programming and asynchronous network programming and coupled that with um, high latency network, uh, uh, high latency network techniques, and then brought that together to create a ridiculously efficient and very, very um, low overhead and low network utilization um, bus, which is why we are the least chatty event bus that you're ever gonna see. Um, it's ridiculously efficient. And so that's just one of the pieces. So when it comes to just a fan out of, of a single action, one of our users tested us against Ansible and they said, okay, I've got 15,000 devices. And they said, how many systems, one, how many systems are we gonna need to manage those 15,000 devices with salt? The answer was one. They were pushing that one system to the limit. We usually don't recommend that you attach 15,000 to one salt master, but they only really needed one to make it work. With Ansible, they had eight servers that were set up to manage those systems. And then they told those systems, all of them to change a user password to just see how long it would take. So for salt to, in this scenario to change 
the user password on 15,000 systems, it took a little less than a minute. Ansible took two hours and 40, uh, between, a little over two hours and 45 minutes. And so, sure, somebody may say Ansible is easier, but would you write a performance application in Bash because it's easier instead of writing an app, a performance application you're actually going to use in a language that isn't slower than molasses? Okay. So, sorry, a question about Ansible came up, and sometimes I just kind of lose it and kind of kind of rag on those guys. They've ragged a lot on me over the years, and frankly, their technology is garbage. Um, okay, so there are a lot of functions that come with Salt, and again, keep in mind these are this is just the function backend. We haven't even touched the configuration management systems and functions that manage everything from, in this case, big IP units. Um, to setting up network bridges, to managing ButterFS. Um, and a lot of the ButterFS management is in here because Salt is used as a component inside of uh, operating system installers for some major distributions, um, in particular, SUSE. Uh, let's see. And so SUSE is the one who's maintaining the ButterFS stuff. But it just keeps going. Shroot commands. Um, shelling out to command lines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we were just in the C's. And so if we come back and want to use salt, we can do a lot of interesting things. Because the next thing is that multiple operating systems <sighs> really? This is all my fault, by the way. Weird. Let me try and start this with a different path. Okay, multiple operating systems handle backend operations in different ways. Salt normalizes those operations across, um, Salt normalizes those operations across all major distributions. And so I've got a Linux system here. And on this Linux system, I'm able to list all of the software packages that I have. One of the other things that I should note is that all the information that we get back from these execution commands is 100% JSON serializable. That means that it becomes very easy to ingest all of this information. There's no need to ever parse this stuff ever again, because we can come back and we can say, I want to gather all of the packages and all of the package versions across 18 different uh, Linux distributions and Windows and, and Apple. And all, I can, and all I have to do is say package.list packages, and bam, I've got all that information. This is the back plane of how another product that we have is built. So one of the products that we have um, at VMware around Salt is called Salt Stack SecOps. And so Salt Stack SecOps utilizes Salt's existing abstraction systems to be able to scan operating systems significantly faster. And so all of those abstractions around packages and file management means that we're able to build that, that those uh, security scans in a significantly more efficient way um, than a lot of other tools that are out there. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, I thought somebody said something. Uh, someone just asked uh, in the chat, will Salt have the same scalability and performance even if we use SSH instead of minions as some customers don't want agents to be deployed on the endpoints? Salt, okay, so I mentioned earlier that we have Salt SSH and we also have a system called Heist. 
If you use salt SSH, salt SSH is not as fast as salt because it still has to use SSH to make connections. But salt SSH is still significantly more performant than Ansible because it is able to temporarily cache um, uh, agent code on the remote systems. So follow on calls are significantly faster, but still not the scalability of salt. And that's why we wrote heist. Heist will make those SSH connections. And so you can say, all right, I'm going to run heist, which takes about as long as one salt SSH command across. So say you're across a thousand uh, systems and you're on heist, it'll take the same amount of time, give or take half a minute to set up heist and make all the SSH connections, deploy the ephemeral agent. And then through those SSH pipes, you'll have a fully up to speed salt system. Now with that fully up to speed salt system that we're looking at, um, yes, that will have the same performance characteristics. And then when you kill heist, it'll clean them all up as if you were never there. Um, and, so, and the other thing to keep in mind is that all agentless management systems, Ansible included, uh, are going to be de deploying code to the, to the remote systems. It's just that that code gets cleaned up when you're done with your operations. So SALT SSH, no, it's not as fast as SALT. SALT with heist, once the setup is complete for a group of routines, yes, um, you're looking at the same performance characteristics. All right. So a couple other remote execution commands that I'd like to show you uh, is network dot interfaces. And so here's all the network information about uh, my minion. And one of the great things about the network about this is again, it's completely normalized. Uh, when you're dealing with large numbers of systems, it can be a real pain in the neck, right? to be able to parse information from large disparate systems. SALT gives you this direct backplane into your infrastructure. And with that direct backplane into your infrastructure, uh, it just makes even routine management tasks significantly easier. And again, this is one of the reasons why SALT should not be directly compared to other config management tools because they don't do any of this. Um, we have a vast, vast library of being able to abstract away systems management routines. All right. So the next thing that I want to talk about is that I actually uh, go back to my presentation, which I literally started this by saying I should have downloaded a PDF, and and this is this is just uh, it's it's just ridiculous. <laughs> I've never been jinxed twice like this in one day. I am, um, I'm just really embarrassed. <laughs> Well, it's important that we keep you humble. Otherwise, you would just float away on a golden cloud for your salt brilliance. So <laughs> it's essential. Yeah, no, now, you I'm... do have a question in the chat if you'd like to. Oh, there's another one? Tackle that. Yeah. Um, uh, they asked, are, you, are there any plans to add database vulnerability management in SecOps? Also, are there any plans to integrate VMware Carbon Black vulnerability management? Yes and yes. So. Um... Uh, to, to be honest, we were really closing in on database management before the acquisition. Um, and uh, that, that work has kind of been sidelined a little bit as we've gone through a lot of the motion of uh, getting integrated into VMware. Uh, we are actively in discussions with Carbon Black um, and the Carbon Black team is really excited to bring in our SecOps tools. Uh, there's, a couple other, uh, there's a couple other areas inside of VMware uh, that are also interested in bringing, bringing SALT into their tools as well. 
Uh, this is this is something that I'm really excited about because we should be able to uh, we should be able to enhance a lot of platforms inside of VMware. And this is also a message that if I'm if I'm candid, um, I probably shouldn't be too terribly candid because this is being recorded. Uh, but if I'm candid, that's one of the areas that we've been pushing really hard uh, to get deeper integrated into VMware. Uh, because from a salt stack perspective, I see a massive amount of, amount of value in SecOps. Um, and SecOps was really where I wanted to take SaltStack as a company uh, before the acquisition happened. And so as we get more and more traction with SecOps inside of VMware, I am just getting more and more and more excited to see that um, shake out in a bigger way. Uh, thank you for the question. I finally recovered. Any timelines? I am not going to present a timeline in this uh, in this scenario. <laughs> um, right, well, that's the ultimate jinx. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there are plans to add compliance features for uh, uh, PCI DSS and HIPAA. Uh, one of the things that's nice about uh, PCI DSS and HIPAA is that uh, many of the compliance checks can be lined up with checks that we already have. Um, and we've actually got a significant amount of metadata in the checks in SecOps that we already have, uh, particularly around uh, uh, so, that, so that we know when they overlap into these other areas. Um, and these questions are persuading me that perhaps the next meetup that we have, sh we should probably uh, bring someone like Alex in uh, to do a SecOps demo. And so I'll have to keep that in mind. All right. The next thing that I want to mention is something called grains. And I think I talked briefly about grains last time. And so I might dive in uh, into grains a little bit more. But when we're building system abstractions, we have to be able to know what the attributes of the system is. And understanding the attributes of the system is something that we need to have readily available. So I can very easily run remote execution commands to derive all of this information. As you've seen a few examples of with uh, things like getting IP addresses, for instance. But um, we need to have this information much more readily available in most of these cases so that we can make determinations about how we're going to be interfacing with the system. But this also means that this information, since it is readily available and is cached in RAM, can be accessed for multiple purposes. And so this is where we tie back into being able to highlights some of the functionality that we have inside of SALT's targeting systems. And so again, when it comes to SALT's targeting systems, uh, this was actually one of the most difficult things for us to build into the enterprise product into SALT stack config, because having dynamic targets that are displayed on the UI when we've got information about those systems in databases is very difficult, especially very difficult from a security perspective. Um, and, we're, and I'm very proud of uh, the team being able to navigate those waters. But so as you can see, the operating system of the host that I'm dealing with is, is uh, Arch. I'm running Arch Linux because I'm just that kind of nerd. And so what I can do is this target that I'm putting right here means everybody. And by default, we are targeting against the ID of the systems. And so now I'm saying all IDs. I could just as easily say the one system that I'm targeting specifically to go after a single system or every system uh, that begins with an F. 
the target that we're looking at right now is um, just using globular expressions, uh, which is similar to uh, file name matches. We default to globular expressions because they're just incredibly easy to use. Um, and so if I just do a quick salt help, we can go to the target options section. And what we can see here is that we can target based on regular expressions instead of globular expressions. We can make an explicit comma delimited list of systems that we want to hit. This is particularly useful when we are uh, connecting into a script to run salt, or we can target based on grains. And so we've got a lovely little example here of targeting based on grains. And so I can say, okay, that didn't work because uh, I, didn't, I didn't do that. That's, it's getting late. Man, this is, this is an embarrassing fumble fest. <laughs> The grains targeting system is also based on globs. So we can say everybody that's got an operating system that begins with AR. Um, or we can target using instead of globs to target the value of the grain, we can, we can use regular expressions or Perl compatible regular expressions. A few other things that we have is a concept called node groups. You can specify node groups inside of the master configuration that says that uh, you can have a specific target in place. Um, the range system is uh, still in here. Uh, there is a CMDB style system for organizing uh, hosts called range that is not widely used anymore. Um, but that was contributed very early on uh, because it was used by our first, one of our first really, really big users, LinkedIn. Uh, you can also target based on pillar and based on IP address. And uh, one of my favorite things is that you can target based on something called compound targets. Compound targets allow you to string together with Boolean logic multiple plausible targets so that you can say something like I want to target all of the Linux servers that are that start with web or I want to target uh, all of the specific um, uh, uh, let's say I want to target all of the database systems or I want to target um, uh, yeah, everything that has a particular key that we've specified in the pillar. Okay, so that's targets really quick. And hopefully, as you can see, still very, very straightforward. System attributes, we can target based on those. Arbitrary keys and values we wanna put in, we can target based on those. Some of the other things to keep in mind that we're running out of time, I won't demo, but you can manually set grains as well. And the grain system, like everything else in SALT is pluggable. So you can extend the grains that are being that are being found on systems very very easily. Um, all right, now before I dive into and I I've got one last thing in the slides here on um, on the salt event bus. and on a few more tools. So I'll just mention these really quick instead of doing a full demo. Uh, I showed salt key. Um, and, uh, and the salt run command allows you to do things specific with the salt uh, master. And salt call allows you to get access to everything inside of salt from a minion perspective without necessarily having to connect to a master. So you can run salt call with or without a master. And we've got some people who use salt call exclusively as a, for instance, as a package manager uh, because it abstracts everything away. And then the last thing I wanna mention is the event bus. 
Um, SALT's event bus, everything that's happening behind the scenes shows up on SALT's event bus. And so when we run a remote execution command, we can see the return information on the event bus. We can see, uh, we can see all of the handshake information and the broadcast information and the publication information on the event bus so that we can have a very detailed, not only trace of actions, but also we can pipe that event bus into other, other systems. All right. There are a number of questions in chat. Uh, which I'm going to dive into uh, in the order in which uh, I can easily read them and answer them. Uh, one is that, oh, I mentioned that LinkedIn uses SALT. Um, LinkedIn chose SALT very early. LinkedIn was the first major, major uh, uh, company, big installation to use SALT. And uh, they started using SALT very, very, very early. They chose uh, they chose SALT because of remote execution and solely because of remote execution. When I went out to LinkedIn um, and had a, uh, and did a meetup there in 2014, years after states had been introduced, uh, they said that they were still using Puppet and uh, uh, they were asked, well, why, you guys are huge SALT fans, why are you using Puppet, and they came back and said, well, we started using SALT before it had config management. And so really what they were doing is controlling software deployments, querying systems, and running vulnerability remediation. Um, and they chose SALT because nothing else could do those things at the, at the scale that SALT can. And Still, nothing else can do those things at the scale that SALT can. Um, another question is, are there any gap or differential uh, between eAPI performance and community API? Do we have a report on that? Uh, there is a gap between um, the community API and the enterprise API that comes with SSC. Uh, they're implemented differently and they need different use cases. Uh, when it comes to performance, if you're going to just do a remote execution command, the community API is going to come back a little quicker. The reason for that um, has nothing to do with overall performance and more to do with the fact that hardly anything's happening. <laughs> uh, the, the community API is just basically giving you a direct hook into the command line API over REST directly on a salt master. The enterprise API uh, differs because we're able to tie multiple masters into the uh, salt stack config platform. Um, the enterprise API differs because we actually store all of the return information. So when we say performance, we have to have a couple of misnomers. One, the salt masters check into the enterprise API periodically, um, which means that those are cached for a few seconds before they're run. And so that wait time is one of the factors. Uh, the next factor that we run into is that all of that information gets piped back into a database. And so, that, and so that's a factor. Um, the next factor from a, from a performance perspective is that we actually see see kind of a cross on the, on the graph. And so I'm gonna be terrible and I'm gonna like stop the share and like do a hand graph that, uh, you know, with the SALT API, you're gonna have a bit of a curve over time, um, but, but a single SALT master is gonna max out at how many minions it can manage. And so if you've got to work with more than one SALT master, to manage larger numbers of minions over the open API, it, it doesn't, I mean, you've got to hit multiple masters and, and coordinate that on your own. Um, the other thing is repeat lookups of the data. The salt master throws away all of its data after 24 hours. Um, and if you're running a lot of commands on a salt master, a lot of people optimize them by saying, hey, uh, I'm not going to cache information for even 24 hours. I'm going to get rid of it after say just an hour. Um, whereas the enterprise platform gives you a full audit trail of everything that's happened in perpetuity. Um, so, long as you, uh, so long as you want to 
retain all that information. And so uh, I guess the last thing that I'll mention there from a performance perspective is that the enterprise API will cross um, the, the open API when it comes to scale because the enterprise system is able to ingest larger volumes of data um, because it has persistence, because it has backing, uh, because it's able to rely on uh, uh, funneling this data through more pipes um, because of how it caches the returns from the salt master, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's, it's difficult because if you come back and you say, oh, I'm just hitting the open API and I've got 10 minions, yeah, it's gonna be faster because there's, there's nothing in between. Um, it's gonna be faster every time. Uh, but if you're actually trying to do robust operations, which is what Salt Stack Config is for, uh, then you're gonna be just fine on a performance perspective. Um, also with that said, there are a number of tweaks that you can do. If that raw performance is what's important, we can increase the, the how chatty the network is um, and uh, to, to get better performance. But again, at the cost of how chatty the network is, and it changes some of the load profiles. Uh, we've got it optimized in a, in, in a balanced kind of setup by default. Um, okay, um, another question is, do you realize operations has compliance dashboards, however limited remediation capabilities outside of vSphere hardening? Are there plans to integrate more salt-based capability into VR ops uh, to perform remediation of objects against the available? I'm gonna have to defer that to product. Um, we're, we're actively discussing how we want to integrate more with uh, uh, vRealize operations um, and what that's gonna look like. Uh, but at this point, I don't, I don't have enough finite information to give you something that's really solid. And so if, if you wanna know that one, I'd suggest reaching out to, uh, reaching out to Alex. Um, and uh, feel free to hit me up on Slack and I'll, I can forge you that information, but he can give you a really, really crisp kind of certified answer. Um, I am grossly paranoid about giving product timeline answers off the cuff uh, if, I don't, if I don't know exactly what they are and uh, I'd hate to make a suggest, I'd hate to make a mistake. And for anyone uh, watching this who, you know, isn't, isn't blessed to have contact info for Alex, uh, you can absolutely reach out to us at uh, saltproject at vmware.com. Okay. And uh, in our last minute, Tom, do you want to tackle that last question about um, using Salt for Windows, Linux laptops, and desktops? Oh, I missed that one. Uh, yeah. Salt is used a lot uh, to manage laptops, uh, Windows, Linux, and Apple. Um, uh, laptops and desktops. So uh, we've, got, we've got some big companies that do this. Uh, I'm trying to remember uh, if, if I'm okay disclosing some of them, but a very, very large financial institution that you have heard of before uh, uses SALT to manage the desktop systems um, at all of their branch offices, for instance. Uh, and those are all running Windows. Um, another major financial institution that you've heard of that's a bank uh, uses SALT um, uh, to manage their internal Windows systems from a from an IT perspective. Um, so this is this is a very very normal model that we have in place. When it comes to building out functionality inside of Salt, we are still data center first. Uh, but with that said, uh, we can manage everything on Windows. And heck, if you can manage Linux from a data center perspective, you can do anything on Linux. So yeah, that's definitely the case. There's a few network connectivity issues that you run into with laptops. Um, and so there's some settings that need to be tweaked to give you a really optimal laptop management experience. Uh, and uh, we've, we've got people in support and engineering that can help you navigate those. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay. No, that's great. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming and being here. We, of course, always appreciate getting to hear from Tom. And again, if you want to touch base any more with Salt Project, uh, you can find just about everything you need at saltproject.io. So thank you again so much, everyone, for being part of our virtual meetup. 
we will absolutely have to do this again and uh, look forward to it. Thanks everyone, have a great rest of your day. And thank you again, Tom. Thanks.